How are we doing, guys? Um, everybody good? Happy Monday. Um, getting ready for a really good opponent this week on Saturday. Done watching all the film yesterday. Uh, met with our players. Nothing's changed uh, in regards to our schedule. So uh, player day off today. Practice in full pads tomorrow and go from there. Um, guys are looking forward to <clears throat> an opportunity to go to Boulder. Uh, play a lot better than we did uh, when we were there a couple years ago. And then, uh, you know, see how good we can get. Uh, how much do you pay attention to pro football focus? <clears throat> uh, I use the, the pro football focus exos aspect of it where we can find information about plays, games, people constantly. I don't pay attention to the grades of Pro Football Focus, uh, but the information that they have is fantastic. So in our computer systems, we're able to pull up <clears throat> every play action pass, every team that has ever run pro or college. We're able to do so many different things. I think it's a great, Pro Football Focus is phenomenal. Um, I don't get caught up in their grades, so. And why don't you get caught up in the grades? Uh, we grade our own players. I grade them. I know what they look like. And um, our coaches all grade our players. And um, I know I saw that what Jordan Morgan was ranked, was graded highest this past week or something like that in the pack. Um, uh, someone brought that to me, so that was cool. But um, I think a lot of times when you're grading a player, you don't necessarily know what their role is on that play. Uh, you don't get the play call when you're grading them. You're just grading them on kind of the way football works sometimes, and sometimes some things change. So just not something I get wrapped up in. <clears throat> Colorado did this massive rebuild uh, this past offseason with no cap on how many players they could bring in. When you came here, there still was a cap. Would you have done anything differently, do you think, if the cap didn't exist? Um, well, yeah, you know, our situation was very different than theirs in that regard. Uh, first of all, the university um, has to make a decision. Are they going to allow you to keep players on scholarship but still bring in new players? Meaning you could still, you could change your roster two years ago. I could have, but the university chose not to do that, uh, which means you could, I could have said as a first time, or not a first as a first year head coach, there's a rule in place that you could keep guys um, not as a non-countable scholarship player and they just not play football. And you could just say, we'll pay for your tuition, but you can't play football. Um, that's what they did with some of their players. Most of their players went in the portal. Uh, we just chose, uh, or we chose not to do that, our university chose not to do that. And then our university signed the recruiting class before we arrived. So we wound up having two spots open um, when I got here, and then we ended up bringing in about seven or six in the portal. Uh, yeah, I would probably say we would have handled it differently um, in 2023. Um, probably would have handled it differently myself. The university may have handled it differently, but uh, they chose to do it their way. And, um, you know, I think 10 out of 11 defensive starters are transfers. And uh, number 43 is the only guy that was on the team a year ago defensively that started. And then offensively, uh, clearly they made, uh, I think it's probably 10 or 11, 10 out of 11 there too. Uh, so it's a different team, it's a different build than what we did. What, what, do you, what do you think has been the biggest difference between what we saw from Colorado and the way they were playing in those first few games to what's going on with them now? They've won, they've won like one out of the last six games or something like that. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> you look at, I mean, there were some fluke things that have happened to Colorado. I mean, they're up 29 nothing at halftime. I'm sure that they weren't expecting to not win that game. Um, a lot of things have to happen for you not to win that game. Uh, I would say that, so they were playing really good that game until the second half didn't go their way. Um, they lost to UCLA by 12 uh, on the road. So that was against a really good team. They lost last week um, by a score or so. Uh, against a really good team. So I think they're playing pretty good. I just don't know if the score's gone their way um, the last few weeks. They beat ASU. Uh, so, you know, it's a team that, um, they, yeah, they got the first couple games. They started 3-0 and or whatever it was, but they won a double overtime game against Colorado State. 
And then they wound up doing a great job of uh, against TCU to start the season. They played a great game against Nebraska. So they're a good football team. And I think that they uh, have a lot of potent weapons that uh, can cause us a ton of challenges. So I don't know. They just might have gotten in a little bit, a couple games here or there that they haven't won. But they're right in it every single week, 7-6 uh, against UCLA at halftime, I believe it was. So... Uh, we know we're going to have a great battle, especially on the road. Of all those Colorado players who went in the portal were a couple in the spring that are now here with, with Taylor in Montana. Um, have, have you had any talks with them about trying to not even think about what their time was there and just treat this as a regular game? Yeah, you know, college football has changed so much. <coughs> we had um, Manoa and Tia and we're now in Irby last week that we had to have similar conversations with. Uh, you can keep kind of going backwards. You know, there's always gonna be something, right? Or someone that came from a certain school um, nowadays that you used to not have to deal with. So yeah, uh, we talk about it and we try to not make it personal, not make it emotional, just play football. Just go play a team, um, go out there. Don't worry that you came from there. Don't worry about that um, you made a decision to go somewhere else and just play ball. And uh, I think if we could be focused and disciplined and playing ball um, and have three penalties again like we had last week, then we're doing it right. If we start getting silly and start doing some dumb things, then um, we got to clear that up. So there's different types of it's personal? There are plenty of different types, I guess. Um, you guys qualify for a bowl. Everyone's excited. You got to turn around and play another game. How do you make sure that the focus is reined back in? Yeah, I mean, the game, I mean, we qualified for a bowl. That doesn't mean really anything other than we qualified for a bowl. We have, it wasn't the last game of the year. It wasn't that we were five and six and, you know, won the 12th game to get to a bowl game. And then we go find out the next two days later where we're going. Um, you just go, now we go play Colorado and we try to get to seven and three. And that's the goal. Um, it's, you, you have a little bit of a, Let's call it, and one of our goals is to play 13 or more games. So we hit that goal. That's all that happened. We hit that goal to play 13 or more games. Now we have an opportunity to reset and start trying to achieve other goals. And um, one of which clearly is going to be to go 1-0 uh, this week and figure out a way to make sure that we take care of business in Boulder. When Upshaw committed to you guys, one of the first things he did was tweeted the date of this game. And he is clearly excited about this game. Is there anything you can tell us about how what happened with him at Colorado that he wound up here, or if just the whole situation? Yeah, I didn't know that, that he tweeted that. Uh, no, I have no idea actually what happened to Colorado. I know him from, I heard things about Mich at Michigan, you know, that uh, that was where most of my research was uh, at that point in time. He was only at Colorado for a spring. So when he went into the portal, um, I called the guys that I know over at Michigan that, that he was at for his career, really, and where he got his degree, and um, just said, you know, tell me about the guy. Um, and then whatever he chose to do, why he chose to go in the portal after the semester or not, I don't really know. I never really asked him. Uh, he became available. He reached out. He wanted to become a part of our program, uh, wanted to, you know, help us on the defensive line. He's done a fantastic job. I think he has seven and a half sacks on the year and um, has become a real disruptive pass rusher. So we're excited that he's on our team. Um, you talked about the 2022 class and how much it's, it's meant to the program. What about that group has led to the success that they've had personally? Well, I think, <clears throat> I mean, it was just, we knew it was a really good class, right? It was, you know, arguably ranked the best class in the Pac-12. and. You had players that have traditionally not been coming to Arizona come to Arizona. You had guys that were committed to other programs decide to come to Arizona instead. You had, I don't know, five or six four-star players in the class. You could argue that T-Mac was a five-star player in a lot of people's books. Um, you had Fishens Price Sock come. You had Jonah Coleman come. You had people that may or may not have been thought of as um, people might not have known how good they were until they got here. Jonah Savanea. Um, but you start naming all the people in the class and it's one after another after another that we're watching play. So uh, what do I think? They're all high character. Uh, Noah Fafita did a fantastic job of rallying a lot of the troops. 
uh, Jacob Manu did a great job of rallying the troops. And we see what it looks like when you look out there and you could see, I don't know, Prysock, Takario, you know, as the two corners, both of which were in that class. And you go inside and you see Manu as a linebacker was in that class. And you go to the defensive line and you see Ty Ty and Russell Davis and Isaiah Ward. They were all in that class. Jacob Kagaika in that class. And then you go across the way and you see Jonah Sevenea and Jonah Coleman and Noel Fafita and T-Mac and Kevin Green and... I mean, you just keep going and going and going, and there's probably another 10 that I forgot to mention that have all impacted the program in a lot of ways. And um, I think we're playing with, I said it, I think 13 starters from that class out of 22. Um, that means they're either fresh, redshirt freshmen or sophomores because they played as freshmen. So that's pretty impressive. And then the, the moment when you guys are going into the fourth quarter, you all meet up on the field, what are you guys talking about? What's the perfect? Finishing. Finishing. Uh, fourth quarter is... Our favorite quarter, we feel like we work extremely hard to get to the fourth quarter. It's a very important um, part of our standard is to how we finish and uh, what we do at the end of games. And we know you don't win games in the first quarter. You don't win games in the second quarter. No matter uh, if people are worried about if we were starting fast or not early enough in the season, uh, you win games in the fourth quarter. That's where you win games. And if you score enough points in the fourth quarter, you'll win. And that's what we talk about, and that's our mentality, and that's our focus and uh, we just remind them of that when we get in there. Last question. Yeah, Jake, when teams are good, uh, typically the players that the coach has have high IQs for the sport. Can you talk about your team and its high IQ for football? Yeah, I think uh, there, there's no doubt that our team has a very high football IQ. We throw a lot of football at them. Um, we run a, as we said, a pro-style offense with the exact same verbiage as a lot of NFL teams use. Uh, these guys understand that each week we have a different game plan based upon how we want to attack coverage uh, and how we want to attack a front. Uh, if you're going to be a game plan specific team on offense, then you have to have high football IQ. If you look at what we're doing on defense, we have plenty of different personnel groups. We move guys in and out to different spots. We play different coverages. We teach different pass concepts and run, uh, run fits. And if you're going to do that, you need to have a high football IQ. So uh, we believe that if you come to Arizona, uh, you have to have a football IQ that's going to allow you to be a pro. And that's what we look for. We don't look for guys that just want to line up right and left. We don't look for guys that just want to uh, play in a system that doesn't motion. We don't want to look for guys defensively that only want to line up uh, and do one job. We want people that are smart and that want to play on Sundays. And if you want to play on Sundays, you better be able to pick up a lot of football in a short period of time. Okay, thank you.